comes to ADD, attention deficit disorder, I've read a lot of books. I thought they were describing my youngest daughter, that they'd been following her around. And then I shared those books with my guy. And he was like, were they following me around? Because he was the kid who was running up and down the halls, delivering the principal's messages to the teachers because they couldn't keep him in his seat. And then my sister said, Jackie, you know, they finally figured out why I struggled so much growing up. And they told me that I'm actually got dyslexia. And now I can learn some things that are gonna help me navigate the world. And I thought that this was amazing. Here are all of these tools that are helping people navigate the world. And then I met Carol. And Carol said, and has convinced me that everything that I knew about ADD and dyslexia wasn't true. So to explain that and to help us all find out what is the truth about these two labels, here's my friend, help me welcome to the studio, Carol Vinzi. Carol, you have the power. Turn on your camera and your microphone. And the, oh, there you go, Carol, New York. How are you? You're still muted, darling. So unmute. Technology at its best. <laughs> <laughs> Thank there you so go. much. Oh, you are so welcome, Carol. How are you today? Wonderful. And I've enjoyed some of the presentations that yesterday that was really enlightening. So I appreciate the program that you've put together. This is truly amazing. Thank you. I'm so grateful that you had the time to be part of this. I mean, it's really close to me, as you can tell. I mean, I've got my daughter, I've got my sister, I've got so got grandsons that we're being given all of this information that's supposed to help us. And I'm not sure any of it's working. <laughs> well, it is a difficult puzzle to put together. Uh, if I go back and look at my... Uh, life since I have enough gray hair to have accumulated a number of years. I started, I was an entrepreneur at 16. Oh, doing what? I started teaching piano lessons to young children to pay for my college tuition. Wow, cool. And, and if I go back even further than that, in first grade, I desperately wanted to be a class monitor when the teacher left the room. And the question was, can you put the initials of one of the students on the blackboard? And I couldn't. <sighs> to this day, I still struggle with phonics. And I only realized a couple of months ago in a workshop that I participate in on a regular basis that I self-branded myself as stupid in first grade. And yeah. that was a tremendous burden to carry all these years. Oh. Despite the fact that I started my own business at 16, I paid for all of my college tuition. I was very glad in those days it was significantly less than what it, what it is today. But I, you know, I managed to have 22 credits in sophomore year of college and 13 students. I didn't do very well in physics class, but... Uh, you know, that was the burden that I had. And I graduated with no debt and enough money to take a vacation with my classmates and buy a camera and go to Canada for the expo and then start my corporate career and did very well in my corporate life. What were you doing in your corporate life? I, I mean, worked I'm, in... I'm, I'm, I'm I, my brain went, wait a minute, wait a minute. Piano teaching. Oh, what did you major in? Well, I majored in mathematics because I didn't have to deal with those funny looking characters on a printed page. Oh, brilliant. And minored in physics and economics as opposed to government, because again, I couldn't keep up with the reading assignments because otherwise I would have been a trial attorney. Ah. My, my disposition is well suited to that type of profession but there was no way that I was going to be able to keep up with the reading. 
And in those days, there weren't concessions offered that there are today for, you know, people reviewing your work and, and correcting the misspellings and, you know, the software that's available now. I mean, I'm a writer and people say, how can you possibly be a writer with dyslexia? Well, thank goodness for spell check. <laughs> You know, I, I read about 50 books a year, but I put reading in quotes because I do them all on CDs when I'm driving. We call that reading with our ears now. I've just yes, found I that heard out. That expression yesterday. Yes. And yeah, I, I learned that yesterday. I was so, I'm like, that's so cool. Yes. And there are podcasts and there are, you know, audio books, which were not available when I went to school. So technology has provided tremendous support for those of us who have alternate learning styles, which is what I call it. Alternate learning styles. I love that because that's not the way I was introduced to these concepts. Absolutely. I actually taught a class for HR people in alternate learning styles. And, and one of the examples I used since that they were HR professionals, and they had to cover you know, discrimination issues. And I said, if you took the same presentation and, and presented it to a, the accountants in your organization or the salespeople in your organization, the same exact document, one of the groups is going to throw tomatoes at you. Because the salespeople are going to want to know stories and the accountants are going to want to know the statistics. And that's the same way you need to approach teaching people. And, oh. and the way we learn is different. I mean, my, my brain demands a logical conclusion in any sort of presentation. And I was not very popular as a audience member when somebody was poorly prepared to give a presentation and it made no sense. And my hand was up going, that, that's wrong, right? When they that left an open loop. That's right. Yeah. It, it, didn't, it didn't come to a logical conclusion. They weren't able to defend their position. And, and I wasn't very popular, but it, it just popped out naturally because it didn't make sense. And I was, it, my brain was very demanding, but it also gave me the strength to do what is called in the information technology field. You asked me what field I got into with phase zero designs. What? I'm sorry. What are, what are those? It's a, it's a first step with listening to a, a business owner and them talk about the problems that they have in their business and how to interpret it and convert it into some computer programs or software or actual products. Oh, you, so, okay. So phase zero, right. starting at the very beginning. With at the very idea. beginning. And, and oh. because my brain demanded resolution... I was able, without a script, to ask probing questions and ask the next question and the next question until it was, I was able to describe what the real demands were. And that made me very popular because most of my patriots and peers were not comfortable in an unstructured environment. And yet that's where I was able to exhibit my strengths. You know, that's the opposite of what was recommended about managing ADD symptoms, which was to provide a very structured environment, you know, very, you know, uh, Benjamin Franklin, you know, a place for everything and everything in its place, you know, everything. Yes. Well, yes, that was a quote that he is famous for. But w when you look at the the people even before Benjamin Franklin and the example I like to use is Leonardo da Vinci long before anybody even thought about ADD or ADHD. He was known as the master of the undone. He never finished of, things. The master of the undone. I've never heard that quote about him before. He never finished things. Right. He would get 80, 90% done and then lose interest. And that's, that's what gets us excited about things. It has to be unique. It has to be challenging. And there typically has never been done before. And that gets our creative juices fired up. But once we can see to the end, we get bored because it's no longer a challenge. Uh -oh. We've connected all the dots 
So we're done. Have you been following me around in my business career? <laughs> well, when you say your children help you, I'm assuming that they have skills that complement your creativity. They do. And, and that's, that's the thing that I try to help people understand. And when I grew up, it was like, focus on your weaknesses. You've got, everybody's got a flat side. You've got to work on that. And I once, I got a hundred in the geom geometry regions, sophomore year in high school. And because I barely passed Spanish, they wouldn't let me take advanced math. What? They, oh, yeah. I, you know, this is one of the horror stories of my education. Uh, and, you know, the, their theory was, we're going to give you extra time to work on your Spanish. Well, I can't do phonics. So I could spend a lifetime looking at a book, trying to learn to speak a foreign language, and nothing is going to happen. Whereas math was just, it made sense. It was easy. I never labored over. Uh, oh, my goodness. I, I, I had never, never. <laughs> I'd never connected those two dots when, uh, you know, uh, all of a sudden I'm getting this flashback. Like, oh, wait a minute. Um, I was a, my original major in college was mathematics. Yeah. I didn't matriculate at that time. I didn't attend college straight out of high school, but that's what I had applied for and gotten accepted for uh, was mathematics because it made sense in a life that did not make sense. Mathematics made sense. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so at the time the educational system had no clue. And it was like, you just have to work harder. And, and I'm, I'm, preparing a couple of books. And, and I, I was recently reminded, uh, James Clear, who's the author of a, a Atomic Habits, had this quote in his weekly newsletter. He said, if you think you learn a lot by reading books, try writing one. Yes. And, and I am going through the writing process, and it's pulling up a lot of memories for me of things that you know, we're positive and things that are negative. And the books, I'm intentionally not talking about the defects and deficits of ADD and ADHD. I'm focusing on the strengths because the pace of business in today's environment is so fast that we don't have time to work on our weaknesses. And the interesting thing is there's a huge population of people who will do the things that we will never get to. Oh, yes. Absolutely. So partnering with someone like that is, oh, yeah. is the secret to success. I'm absolutely loving this. That, that is a huge quote. We'll be pulling that one out that says the speed of business today, and we'll actually get your words, but the speed of business today, we don't have the luxury of working on our weaknesses. That's right. That's an incredibly powerful statement that frees people to focus on their strengths and to partner with people who have the complementary skills. And if we could teach our kids to do that, if the schools would allow that, you know, we, we could actually change the face of education, but that's not our motive today. Um, our motive today is to bust the myth around ADD and dyslexia and I just am in the middle of reading Malcolm Gladwell's book, David and Goliath, where he has a chapter that says no parent would wish dyslexia on their kid, or would they? And he dives into what are the advantages? You know, if you look at people like Tesla, you know, there are some advantages here. If you look Absolutely. at that outcome. Yeah. Well, David Needleman, who is the creator of um, JetBlue, who back in the days when, you know, one-way tickets and self-checking in at the gate was anathema to the airline industry, he has been quoted as saying, if you gave me a magic wand and I could reverse my ADHD, I would not. That the trivial activities that I cannot do do not overweigh the creativity that cannot be taught. 
You know, and you said something about the speed of business and I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to it because I, ha I came up with a theory and I'd love to know what you think of it. Someone in one of the books I read pointed out about the speed of screen uh, scene changes in movies and that how in the 50s, the perspective shifts in a movie go sort of like this. There was this nice little kind of rhythm and that now you watch a movie made today and the perspective changes in the movie are like this. I mean, we're flashing and we're moving. I went to visit my mama once and she had a news channel on and there was the news channel and then there was this going this way and this going this way and stuff scrolling across the bottom. And I thought, oh my God, we are teaching people's brains to have ADD. Well, I, I think that the attention span of the current population is so short that you have to get people's attention. I, I don't think you can teach ADD. I, it is, you know, and this is one of the myths. The, the one thing that in the research I've been doing for one of my books, which is manage your ADD, ADHD with sleep, exercise, and nutrition. I'm, well, the, the initial podcasts are about sleep. And one of the interesting statistics that just floored me was in 1960, 2% of the U.S. population got less than seven hours of sleep a night. In the last okay. decade, more than 35% of the U.S. population gets less than seven hours of sleep a night. So somehow or other, it has a, become a badge of courage to say, well, I only sleep five hours. Well, some of the characteristics of ADD and ADHD are mimicked by inadequate sleep. Sleep deprivation is a thing. I mean, yes, ask any absolutely. parent. Yes, but uh, as a consistent behavior, it is very detrimental. And some of my friends who know about my ADD, you know, will joke that they have ADD light because they didn't get enough sleep over the last week. So some of the symptoms of disorganization and forgetfulness and procrastination are showing up. And one of, you know, I have no research on this, but one of my thoughts is that the staggering increase in the number of ADD and ADHD kids may be due to sleep deprivation. There sleep was, after. yeah, I mean, it used to be nine hours. And even if you spent the first hour reading to unwind, it was, you know, there was eight hours of being yeah. asleep. Yep. And that was such a struggle for me when I was raising my kids to, to keep my kids on a schedule because the three of them had three different sleeping patterns. Yeah. But I get well, it. You know, one of the stories my mother used to tell was because she was an eight hour a night sleeper. And when when I was young, my dad was still in the military. So it was the two of us. And she was hoping to get back to her eight hours of sleep. And she told the story of my standing in my crib, firmly announcing that I cry more because I was done with this boring activity known as sleep. And I was ready to attack the world. So it started for me at a very early age. I typically don't sleep as much as the average person. I never have. And people with ADD and ADHD typically don't because their brains don't slow down enough. I, I don't have that issue because I do a lot of exercise. I'm physically active. So when my head hits the pillow, I'm ready to go to sleep. But I wake up, you know, when I was a kid, I was up at 5.30 when milk was delivered to the front door in glass bottles to wait for the milkman so that I could have fresh cold milk for my Rice Krispies and cornflakes. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing the triggers that we pick up along the way. Yeah, I can imagine the sound of two bottles clanking together could probably still wake you up today. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, that was my pattern when it, when it wasn't school time, when we were on summer break, that I would be there waiting for a milkman to show up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how funny. You know, we, we have these wonderful things that make for great stories around our patterns. 
But you said something really interesting that I just want to peel back because it's like, wait a minute, someone with ADD typically sleeps less than the norm. At least that's your experience. That's certainly something I'm aware of in my world. And you said that someone who is not sleeping eight hours or more than seven or more hours, we'll just call it the new normal, seven or more hours a night can have symptoms that mimic ADD. Yes. So the maybe my brain is going, oh, so if somebody I care about has symptoms of ADD, the first thing I might want to do is say, get more sleep and let's see if the symptoms go away. Yes. There's also something known as sleep apnea, which is a misformation in the back of the throat with the tonsils. Don't ask me to you know, get into the biology. All I know is my guy stops breathing. Right. And, and the, the lapses can be anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds. Oh, when I was, count, I used to yeah. wake up at night when he would stop breathing and count. Yes. And when it got to be 15, 20, I'm like, do I wake him up? And then he was, and I'm like, okay, we're taking you to the doctor. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and so that's one of the things that is not talked about enough. And, and one of the things that I've put in one of my podcasts yet to be released is when a doctor asks you if your behavior is normal, never, ever answer that question. Normal because person. what might be normal for you might be life-threatening when compared to appropriate medical behavior. If I could go back in time and take an ear, nose, and throat doctor and strangle them, actually, it was a pediatrician with an ENT, and he asked me, is your kid's mucus normal? And I said, yes, because my kids never had a runny nose that wasn't green. Nobody told me green wasn't normal. Exactly. It, I mean, my kids suffered with a sinus infection because I answered the question not having the context. Yes. So, you know, and, and one of the things I, I put in, in the podcast is doctors need to be trained to ask open-ended questions. And an open-ended question is one that cannot be answered with a yes or no. If he had just said, what color is the kid's mucus, we could have solved the problem right then. Exactly. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of issues going on. And nobody asked me about my sleep behavior. I had a very good friend who said, you have the worst sleeping pattern that I have ever experienced. I used to wake up after three hours of sleep. So I, you know, I'd go to bed at like 11 and by two or two 30, I'd be awake and I'd read for an hour, hour and a half because there was nothing you know, there was no late night TV of any caliber in those days. And then I'd go back to sleep for another three hours. And, and what, was, what was happening is because of my sleep apnea, my brain was uh, screaming for oxygen. Got and it. it woke me up until it got saturated again. And then it would let me go back to sleep for another three hours. And then it would wake me up because, again, the same thing happened. And then I was done for the day. But, you know, wow. I mean, talk about a good, strong survival skill. You know, the, the, the internal mechanism to keep us alive is, is incredibly strong. But that was my pattern for years. And I went for, you know, all of my annual checkups and nobody ever asked me about my sleep pattern. Never. The assumptions that run medical... Um, and well, it runs everything. We, are, we have a world that is run by assumptions and exactly. not enough questions. Yeah. So, and, and the, you know, the topic or the title that we started with is, you know, what's wrong with our understanding of ADD and dyslexia? Let me go back to women typically don't get diagnosed. Women typically we don't, don't get diagnosed with what? ADD or ADHD, oh. because we don't have the hyper characteristics. The little boys in the classroom are my turn, my turn, my turn, so that they get all of the teachers' attention, whereas the little girls are there quietly daydreaming, looking out the window, trying to be the perfect student, so they're ideal students, and they slip through the cracks. 
And, you know, the talk about suicide, that was never an issue for me. I had this incredible drive to survive. So that was, that was never an option or a thought in, in my brain. But the lack of social skills, which I'm only now discovering again as I'm doing research and writing the book and dealing with some of my prior behaviors, are really scary in this era where social media and looking perfect on Facebook has got to be incredibly difficult for the little girls who don't fit in with their peers, who feel all this pressure and, and you know, struggle to be the ideal student, but that's not necessarily in teenage years something to be sought after. I mean, the statistics are that academic performance drops in females as they get into, they go through puberty because they feel it's unattractive. Oh, it's, we've got so many, many memes, so many culturally accepted ways of being that don't serve anyone. And yes. so academic performance dropping in girls in high school has um, a huge impact on the rest of their life. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah. And, you know, and so that's got to trigger, you know, my life isn't worth living because I'm not invited to the right parties or I don't have the right dress. Or I can't, you know, every three months go to the Gap and change my wardrobe or, you know, whatever the... the whatever culture. the yardstick is of the day. Yes. You know, it, it is, um, it is a, a learning that parents are getting wise to. I'm hearing more and more of parents who are not allowing their kids to have social media accounts of any kind. Um, and it's like, okay, cool. Kids gave up Facebook when they realized that we were on it. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. we'll just call it what it is. My grandkids have you know, no clue. Um, and I'm really blessed because my youngest daughter, zero social media. The kids have zero social media. And I'm like, hallelujah. But it gives them another problem. It gives them isolation from their it's peers right. who are talking about, oh, did you see my post on whatever, you know, whatever it is, the, the platform of the day, whether it's Instagram or TikTok or whatever, and they have go no. And so we're getting this, um, more and more isolation and it it's a it's not different from the conversation we're having because we don't know what to do with ADD and ADHD we don't know what to do with dyslexia and we don't know how to handle this what's the best decision for my kid exactly. and, you know so any insight you've got onto this because this is a big conversation well what I was able to navigate was to you know, use my creative energies to find the right role in an organization that really didn't fit my personality style. And that's one of the things that I help people. And one of, one of my books is going to be Thrive at Work with ADD and ADHD. And, and there I talk about understanding your work style. And then finding people in an organization that will tolerate your behavior. Because we are not the easiest people to deal with. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but if you find the right match, it is magical. And that's what I was able to do first by instinct. And then by very careful research and discovery and, and challenging challenges because I don't do very well with somebody looking over my shoulder. You know, I'm oh. likely to say this is a one person job. Either you do it or I do it, <laughs> but get the hell out of my way. If you're expecting me, me to if, do it. If you want to trigger my stress response, you stand behind me looking over my shoulder. Right. I mean, I didn't realize what a big trigger that was, but I reacted just like, you know, the caveman to a dinosaur. Um, and it would shut down my brain. Exactly. 
I mean, you know, I once was asked to do, a, you know, a one day assignment for another manager in the organization I was part of. And, you know, I got no direction. I actually had to put together a one page document on some concept, which I can't even remember what it was, except the experience. I actually delivered it because it had to be delivered by like 430. And I waited in the office until seven o'clock to get some feedback. Was it, you know, was it appropriate? What did it work? Nada. I showed up in my office the next day and said to my boss who asked me to do this, I said, never will I work for that person again under any circumstances. And I explained to him what happened. I mean, that shows total disrespect for there's no interchange of, you know, was I on target? Was it effective? no recognition of the effort that I put into anything. And I, I won't work that way. I just won't. And, and, you know, I explained and he said, I understand. And it never came up again as an issue. When we get the people who don't need feedback and they're partnered with people who do need feedback, there's a problem because the person who needs feedback, uh, has the worldview of everybody needs feedback and they pester the person who doesn't need feedback. And the person who doesn't need feedback doesn't have a clue that it would be helpful if they opened up their mouth you know, right. and gave information. And it's a dynamic that plays out in my home every single day. <laughs> I need almost no feedback, which is a problem and for me, I'm not the easiest person to work with. My guy loves to, you know, he has to have somebody to interact with and, and to talk with. And, uh, you know, he doesn't need, it, it's this dynamic of how much information do I need to make a decision? Yeah. Or to right. take action. And, yeah. and, and, and so not understanding each other's styles led to a lot of conflict for a long time. Yeah. And I actually, part of my business, which has been there for years, is I do assessments for people, which is, you know, not a, you know, social questionnaire, but a really scientifically developed system. And I find it very effective for pairing people so that they complement what they're great at, so that everybody walks out at the end of the day saying, I have the best job in this company because it focuses on their strengths. And the story I tell to support that is Barbara Cochran, who, who used to run a real estate company in New York City, uh, which is a very difficult market for a woman in, in commercial real estate. And she's now one of the judges on Shark Tank, that series here in the U.S., was interviewing a woman and, and in her head, and she talks about this on one of the CDs that she put together, she was thinking to herself, how do I get this woman out of my office? There is nothing we share common. And after 10 minutes of Barbara thinking, okay, this is enough. I've been polite enough. Let me end the interview. The woman opens her purse, takes Barbara's card, and puts it into a filing system in her purse. And Barbara hires her on the spot. Because Barbara, to that point, had only hired super salespeople, just like she is. And so, you know, there, nobody knew who got the listing. Nobody knew who shared commissions when a property was sold. There were files all over the desks. So they could never find anything. And this woman was hired. In three weeks, she had everything organized. Oh, my God. Can we get a clone Exactly. But here is an example of two absolute opposites. And when Barbara sold her real estate business for multi-million dollars, this woman's share of the sale was a seven digit check. Mm -hmm. And and that's what you're looking for when you do anything, whether in life or in business. Who compliments you, not who mimics your your traits, because then you're fighting over the same tasks in an organization. You want somebody who's your opposite and then not try to convert them to your way of, of working. It, the guy who created 1-800-JUNK here in the U.S. is a typical entrepreneur with ADHD, and he is smart enough 
that his second in command is the guy who executes all of his ideas. He, yeah. he comes up with thousands of them. And, and this partner puts the execution plan in place and runs the businesses, which, you know, during the shutdown was a hugely profitable venture because all of the honeydew lists of cleaning the attic in the garage, the local trash company said, not, not my job. We're, we're here to collect kitchen trash and recyclables, not 10 or 15 years of collections in the attic. So 1-800-JUNK probably had their best year in the last two years of oh, business probably. because they got, they got charged with you know, all of the attic and garage stuff that had been accumulating. But he, he has no ability to execute. Everything would flounder. And so that's, that's what you're looking for. Yep. That makes perfect, perfect sense. So the idea that these are somehow handicaps is the outmoded view of ADD and dyslexia. Absolutely. I mean, technology helps a lot, but, you know, I just talked about the guy who started JetBlue. Steve Jobs was ADD, ADHD. You know, Thomas Edison, although there were, you know. There were no tests back then, but we there were no back tests. at his behaviors. Right. And figure but, this out. but his tenacity and, you know, that's the one thing that, you know, I, I've always remembered of, you know, he didn't find 10,000 things that failed. He found 10,000 things that didn't work. And it yeah. was just next, not being discouraged, constantly looking for, for new inventions. You know, we're now doing the Olympic trials. Simone Biles, the gymnast, is ADD. Michael Phelps was ADD. I mean, his mom talks about that extensively, that, you know, the routine, their routine of swimming helped him and the exercise helps. That's one of the things that I, when I went back and looked at my history, consistently exercise was part of my life. I was, you know, I had to walk a mile each way to school. So sometimes two miles, sometimes four always two miles, sometimes four miles. I played classical piano from the time I was in fifth grade through college, which was a physical activity in addition to the emotional and you know, yeah. side, of, side of the process. When I graduated from college and had enough money, I played tennis. When I was introduced to downhill skiing, you know, I told my dad once I had to ski and he looked at me like he had raised the most spoiled child in the world. But what it did was it was that release of that pent up energy and also the secretion of dopamine. Our brains don't naturally secrete sufficient dopamine. And that's been tested scientifically. And so physical activity will secrete the extra dopamine. Whoa, the other, whoa, that's huge. Absolutely. So, you know, when, when kids are in school environments where they cut out gym and there, there aren't facilities to run around outside, that also can contribute. It also contributes to obesity because the other thing that secretes dopamine is eating carbs. So when you're sitting there with a package of nachos or Doritos or Oreo cookies, Holy as opposed to Running this this is like the, the, the key to solving so many problems that I did not know. And all right, we've got the myth busters. I'm a, this myth about dopamine and the fact that there's it impacts every area of the brain, that this is the ADD brain. Absolutely. It, so, is, it is different. There are parts of, of the brain that are different and and you know, I mentioned earlier the sleep patterns, the, the same part of the brain that controls attention also controls sleep. And that's the connection between sleeping less than the typical seven or eight hours. All right. So we are going to give everyone your gift because I think it's an amazing thing. And it is the myth busting around ADD and ADHD. And Carol, I could stay talking to you for hours. So we're going to have to come back and have you come, come back again and come into um, 
even a deeper conversation. The power of being able to give a parent a path to help their child focus on their strengths, to actually be able to see their ADD, ADHD, dyslexia as for what value it brings rather than for what it takes away. That's such a beautiful message into the world, Carol. Thank you so much. Well, let me just mention, I have a Facebook page called Leverage Your ADD Vantages. So if people want to connect with me and, you know, So they can start by getting your gift, but then they can go to the Facebook page, leverage your ADD vantages. Yes. Oh, I love it. Okay. I had to write it out before I got it, but now I got it. Okay. So we'll find that link. We will make sure that everyone gets it in the show notes, Carol, so that they can interact with you there. That's another gift to be able to have interaction with you. So you'll be seeing me show up in there because I've got some ad vantages I would like to know more about. Yep. All right. So the myth. Oh, there we go. So thank you, Katie. The link is in the chat for everyone for your gift, Carol. It'll also be in the show notes. Perfect. Thank you very much for being here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.